it is slightly under 13 hours until clocks across Uganda strike the hour of midnight to herald the 9th of October 2020. When tomorrow dawns, this East African Republic will have notched another groove into the totem pole of self-governance. Now, in the 58 years of Uganda's independence, we will have conducted a total of eight elections, we will have had 10 governments, and we will have had nine heads of state, the last of these, General Museveni Yoweri, having reigned for a sum total of 34 years. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure to welcome you to this fourth edition of the 256 Dialogues. My name is Sulmani Manzi and I will be your moderator. The 256 Dialogues are a monthly event wherein issues that are relevant to social justice, democracy, civic progress, and other such related issues that affect the lifeblood of this country are discussed. And each month we bring you an able panel of Ugandan intellectuals, academics, scholars, citizens from every shade and every stripe of our national conversation to converse on these issues, to discuss and dialogue <coughs> on these subjects as they arise within their individual lines of personal and social effort. The 256 Dialogues, I should remind you, are brought to you by a partnership between two organizations. One of the partners is the African Studies Bookstore, and the other partner is the Friedrich Ebert Stifter, which is an organization that promotes and supports initiatives related to social justice and democracy in this country. Now, to our panel. Our panel, which will be discussing the theme, the future of electoral democracy in Uganda, is constituted of four eminent persons. Each of them, of course, eminent in their respective area of expertise. Now, in no particular order, but starting from my extreme left, I am pleased to introduce Dr. Nansozi Mwanga. Dr. Nansozi is a don or a lecturer in the Department of Political Science at Makerere. And at the same institution, she is acting chair of the Julius Kambarage Nyerere Leadership Center. She is a consultant on governance and educational issues. For the past uh, two years, Dr. Nansozi Mwanga also coordinated the United Nations Development Program Rule of Law and Constitutional Democracy Project. That is still at the Department of Political Science in Makerere. Right next to Dr. Nansozi is Mr. Nicholson Twinamasiko. He's an author. He has uh, published several books, chief among them being The Chwezi Code, as well as Jace's Jewel. He is a publisher who helps other authors get into the market, mm -hmm. and he also happens to be a construction consultant. Next to Mr. Twinamasiko is Mr. Aboneka Michael. Mr. Michael is a lawyer, but he insists that any Tom, Dick, and Harry may be called a lawyer. So he says he prefers to be known as an advocate of the courts of judicature in Uganda. He is a governance expert and a civil society activist uh, who is based at ActionAid Uganda. He also happens to be a partner with Thomas and Michael advocates. So his billables must be quite high. And uh, certainly not least, but finally on our panel, is Miss Mary Mutesi. She is also an advocate, and she is a communications and governance expert. She has consulted widely with the government of Uganda on these particular subjects, and is therefore in the know of uh, what our theme 
and the areas surrounding it uh, are the future of electoral democracy in Uganda. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 256 Dialogues. Thank you. All Thank right. you. Okay, so let's dive right in. I would like to begin by asking our panelists to very briefly introduce their foundational thoughts on this subject. Um, as I mentioned in my primer, this country by tomorrow will have been independent for 58 years. Now, whether that is theoretical or practical independence is a subject I hope we shall delve into. But the self-rule that we have seen in the last close to six decades has been turbulent. It has been defined by strife and civil war. But even in peacetime, there has been a lot of unease and indignance on the part of the Ugandan body politic. Many people feel that all the promises of independence, all of the goodwill, all of the aspirations that the independence generation of Ugandans had, have by and large not quite been fulfilled or even outrightly been betrayed. So I would like to start with Mr. Aboneka. Michael, you're an advocate of uh, the yes, courts sir. of judicature in this country. Advocacy work, uh, formally, of course, uh, in the lawyering profession, but also outside of that, when you look at the broader context of advocacy, is essentially about raising your voice to point out things that may not be going right. Do we have democracy in this country, even where elections are present? Thank you, Suleiman. 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 Yes. Uh, the last time we were together, you were Solomon. And I heard in the corridors that you are Suleiman, and because tomorrow is independence. Thank you so much. And um, the most important question to me is this animal called democracy. Everyone has been defining it and illustrating it according to their own way. And you know that he who has the, the mandate to definition has the power. So people have been defining democracy in their own terms. But what is this animal called democracy? And do we even have it? And I think that as a person who has been following events in this country and to what I practice is that I, wa I am one of the persons who doesn't believe in hyphen democracy. Now, hyphen democracy has, is such as pseudo democracy, you know, hybrid democracy. We either have democracy or do not have. And from the way I look at things, from the way the judiciary is conducted, from the way the parliament behaves, away from the principles, I think we are not yet at the path of democracy. Democracy is, is simple. That let us have the institution work independently. Let us have rule of law and not rule by law. Rule by law is simply that I think we need to catch some people, so let us craft a law. And then that way, once you craft a law for specific people, then you're going to have what we call the cobweb justice system. Cobweb justice system is one where the small insects will be trapped, but the big guys, the animals, the bats cannot be trapped. So you'll have selective justice because of the cobweb justice system coming from the issues of rule by law. We have had various laws, and the recent one has been POMA, which the, uh, the Constitutional Court um, nullified certain sections to, the, to an extent that they infringe uh, Article 29 of our Constitution. So certain laws as, as that have a tendency to, to bring in the issue of rule by law. 
which democracy actually is about. Of course, we all know the, 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 we all know the, the usual definition. Everything is by the people, for the people. And uh, the, question, the question is, where are Ugandans in their democracy? Ugandans have not participated in their democracy, rather they have been participated. We haven't participated in our democracy, but we have been participated. Michael, people vote, they line up to vote. We witnessed the NRM election primaries yes. a few weeks ago. Yes. People willingly went to line up behind their candidates of choice. Yes. Mm. Being and participated implies a passive or coercive element. So being participated is that, yes, you can go vote for Michael or my sister Mary, and that they claim that they are going to represent your views. We had an example during the, you know, the age limit debates. The whole members of parliament come and say that on behalf of my constituency, which actually can, which is almost say maybe 10,000 voters, we are voting no, or we are voting yes. But are you saying that for the entire 10,000 voters, everyone in that constituency said that please remove the age limit? Now, that's where democracy to me now becomes a fallacy by practice in this country. Representative democracy in our country has become a fallacy. Right. My, my, yes. To ask that uh, you first pose it a bit there. Bring Mutesi. Um, Mutesi, Michael raises several issues. Mm. Um, I don't know if you respond to a few of them or uh, all of them in your opening remarks, but I want you to jump in at that point and then also broaden out the conversation about how you understand the subject. Oh, thank you, Selman. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing your name well. Uh, it's um, a pleasure to be here on this dialogue on this panel. Um, we appreciate Frederick Hebert Foundation and uh, African Studies Bookstore for availing us such a platform where we come and uh, make reflections of how far we've come and how far we are and then project into the future to cast either doubt or cast hope for Ugandans. Uh, some time back I, I made a resolve to be one of the few that uh, lead Ugandans into a hopeful future and uh, as I do that, I appreciate the challenges of the present, but it is very minimal in my submissions ever to cast hopelessness for any Ugandan. Uh, first and foremost, um, Uganda is not an exception to the rest of Africa. When you look at uh, the, 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 the history and where we've come from as African people, as African continent. It's been step by step, uh, a history of struggle. Today I, I, I woke up, actually, uh, something was ringing into my, my, my heart. And that is a song called Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me that I was once uh, lost, but now I'm found, and once blind, but now I can see. The man who wrote that song called John Newton uh, was coming from a background of a, a slave trader. One particular statement that gives me hope, and given his background, is that he was writing it at a time when he had turned away from slave trading into now a supporter of abolitionism, abolishing, let me put it that. And uh, he was a good crusader for uh, abolition of tr uh, slave trade. He's a man who had grown up, actually he knew nothing but slave trade, 
because his history says that at the age of seven he went into the hands of his father who was a captain of a slave ship that was failing slaves from Africa to the parts of Europe and other American uh, parts. He grew up knowing that. At a certain time, the man looks at how things were going and he turns away and he says, this is bad. That is Africa and that is where we are coming from. From the level of struggle against the slave trade, we go to the level of colonialism and the uh, struggles therein. Uganda is not an exception. Once we got that struggle against the colonialism, independence and nationalism came in. Thereafter, when we got to that level, it was now the intra, you know, ideologies that were fighting against one another. For Uganda particularly, and uh, most of Africa, we went into the liberation stage. We had in Mozambique, Uganda, and all the other parts of Africa, we were into now a liberation mode. Africans against the Africans were now seeing loopholes in the post-independence governments that took over power and authority from the colonial masters. Things were not good in there, although there were some achievements that we got as Africans. Today, we are at another phase of a struggle. And to me, I think that Africa as a whole, and Uganda not an exception, it is a phase by phase effort. This man, John Newton, one of the stars as those, uh, parts of the song, he says, through many dangers, toils and snares, we have already come. It was grace that has brought us safe this far, and the grace will lead us home. The final one of his song, and that has become a very sweet hymn, is that when we have been there 10,000 years, bright shining as a sun, we shall still make it through. To me, despite the challenges that we may be having in our pursuit for democracy and in our democratization processes, first as African economies, African nations, and then particularly for Uganda, I think we are making headway. When you look at what is on the platter, different from what was in the past, is that at least we are proud of um, a legal framework that we refer to, despite the challenges within there, despite the weaknesses. We are proud now to be critiquing institutions that preside over this democracy, but at least we have those institutions in place. So despite the challenges therein, Uganda, we are heading for a very bright future and the other gaps that we cite therein, and these are not gaps only into the, the, the ushers or the, the, uh, those presiding over this democratic process. These are weaknesses of us as a people of Uganda that we are growing into a system. Lastly, as I wrap up my introductory remarks, we miss it somewhere as Africa. We missed it somewhere as Uganda. When our friends, the Chinese, who are our great friends of recent, when they adopted some of these theories and uh, concepts from the Western world, they put in a spice up and they said, for us, we look at democracy with the Chinese characteristics. When Africa was copying and duplicating and dancing by the tunes of whoever determines the blueprint of what democracy is, we took it wholly. And therefore, we are struggling with a thing that is not typically African, and I think it is time for us to rediscover ourselves and say, where is this democracy with the African characteristics? That is where we went wrong. Thank you very much. You provide a very broad and elaborate history of um, the problem as you see it. 
Thank you. I am sure the, the panelists appreciate it as well. And uh, it is good that you shine rays of hope where Mr. Aboneka Michael so nearly darkness. That's what I see from my end. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like hope to, to see the light. <laughs> indeed, yeah. indeed. Hopefully, we'll have uh, yeah. much more light by the end of the conversation. Yes. Dr. Nansozi, uh, I would like you to come in at this point and um, lead us along your path. Uh, your viewpoints that uh, help to illuminate the path, I'm sure, and also comment on uh, what I feel is now a dichotomy. Imagine, uh, yes. First of all, I'd like to thank, um, I'd like to thank you as our moderator. I'd like to thank the African Bookstore and the Frederick Frederick for inviting us and providing this platform for hopefully having an honest and open discussion. Um, on something that um, I believe that most Ugandans talk about, discuss at various levels, but still find difficult to actually um, uh, digest and find a way forward. Um, the dichotomy that seems to be emerging from the two previous um, presentations by the panelists is that on the one hand, there's dark and gloom uh, and you'll excuse me if I say it on, the, on, on, on one side. And on the other hand, there's an openness and uh, hopefully a uh, future for democracy in Uganda. Um, I'd like to digress a little bit from the two and maybe take a minute around. Um, I find it difficult whenever democracy comes up as a concept for discussion, where I actually fall. Um, I would like to believe that I take a practical approach to democracy. And that practical approach uh, means that I look at things as they are, as opposed to how they were, or how they like them to be. Um, for example, for me, if we're talking about democracy, um, we're talking about things to do with access. If I'm talking about democracy, we're talking about things to do with inclusion. If we're talking about democracy, we are talking about participation. Now, the minute you begin to make excuses for why any of these things do not exist in any particular system, I believe that you're actually veering off from what democracy is. Uh, if some people can access resources, if some people can access education, others can't. If others, some can access um, social services and others can't, uh, and you say, well, you see, they're still on the journey, but for how long? Um, and that, to me, the minute you ask that, you, 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 know, you get into, uh, rather than uh, talking about electoral democracy, Westminster model, presidential model, and so on and so forth, for the practical reason that we are not here to deal with semantics. We are not here to deal with the word democracy, but what does it mean to me? Um, the Ugandans have a very nice phrase these, these days, and I believe that it actually applies to our discussion about democracy. What is in it for me? Um, if, if I elect you to parliament, is it this bar of soap that you're going to give me today? Is that it? Or is there something else I should expect uh, two years, five years down the line. So, if I cannot discuss democracy in those terms, and if I have to go back and discuss democracy in terms of, yes, it is a struggle. I think it's a struggle everywhere. Uh, even the developed countries, as we've noted uh, of recent years, of recent times, actually, with the, the ongoing um, uh, presidential uh, uh, struggle, in the United States, that they too struggle with the issue of democracy. Yeah. Um, they also struggle with who has a voice and who has a voice. But I think it, it would be wrong for us as Ugandans at this point, at this juncture, when we're about to reach 60 years, to say, well, you know what, um, we, we, we're still getting there. Then we should not talk about democracy. We should talk about democratic impulses that Uganda has democratic impulses, but not yet 
on the path of democracy. Um, alternatively, if we begin to look at what is and what is provided in terms of the, the three things that I, I personally believe should be part and parcel of democracy, access, inclusion, participation, if those things do not exist yet, then maybe we should try and find a different word. Maybe we should try and talk about, you know, social service delivery, you know, as opposed to democracy. If my parliament member cannot represent my interests, if my parliament member cannot, I cannot trust him or her to speak for me, yet this is supposed to be for me, by me, then there all right, thank you, Doctor. I just want to pick your mind on something quick before uh, we go to the next panelist. You say these three yardsticks have to be met before you can check the box and say this country is democratic or this particular society uh, has a functional democracy as opposed to just an impulse towards the same. Do you have a country you could name or pinpoint that has achieved satisfactory levels of these three things? And if so, what is the degree? You know, is it something quantifiable? Can you say we now have 90% access or 95% inclusion or something like that? Are these things very ambiguous and difficult to judge and situation specific? Wow, that's a very loaded question. Mm. <laughs> uh, um, I don't, I, 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 would, I, would, I would hesitate at this point to say country A or country B is the epitome of democracy. However, I think that even if you're talking in terms of degrees, when, let me take you back a little bit and I'll try and be brief. In 1997, when UPE was introduced, he said, this can't happen. Why, why are all these children out of school? Suddenly the doors were open, the majority of children got access, and as of the last time that I actually looked at the statistics, we, we really had achieved. We had got to a point where we are comfortable. We are dealing with issues of quality here and there, and so on, but by and large, most children who are school eligible, I'm in school and tell So in the same way, when I think about democracy and I think about things like access, inclusion, and participation, if you wake up today and say that, I don't know, 56, 56% uh, of our, 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 our people um, live on less than a dollar a day, On what basis would you use that to say that there's, there's inclusion, that there is access, that they're participating? I mean, how can you participate when you don't even, yeah. uh, you know, you, you, you are not even at the table? So for me, and I, I you know, I, I, we, can, we can have this morning conversation, is that democracy is not just about being in the vicinity of the table, somewhere on the floor or something. I want this all to be I want us to be able to participate and have access not only to the resources, but also to be able to, do, to be heard. Mm. All right. Mr. Trinomasko, Nicholson, do you agree with Dr. Nansozi or disagree? I partly agree. I partly mm. agree with uh, some of the comments that uh, she has made. Mm -hmm. uh, I certainly agree that uh, there is a, a very little level of access of resources. And uh, I also agree that, uh, you know, it's not about just saying democracy. We've got to be uh, clear about what exactly we are talking about. Uh, and I also agree with uh, Madame Mutisi. When she says that uh, we could to come up with an African uh, version, or an African, an African type of democracy. Okay, well, and I think that is, for me, 
probably the most important part. Because I think that is where we got wrong from the beginning. Because in 1962, our independence, we tried to adopt the West Minister model of democracy. In the West Minister model of democracy, you have a parliamentary system, you have, uh, you know, you have the party that wins the most seats in parliament, taking power, and then uh, the prime minister, the leader that will become the prime minister, and select uh, cabinet ministers from his party, who are also MPs. In the presidential system, you have, you know, a class separation between the legislature and the executive, like in the US, where you have all the cabinet ministers, or what you call cabinet ministers, and members of either the Senate or the House of Representatives. So there's a clear separation. People who are in executive are not in the legislature. Yeah, so we tried to have that kind of system in 1962, you know, the West Minister model. But the head of state in the West Minister model is supposed to be apolitical or, or non partisan. Like in the, US, in the UK, you have the Queen, they don't even vote, the monarchs don't even vote. They are that apolitical or non partisan. But in our case, you had somebody who had a party which was part of the ruling coalition. That's the person who was supposed to be the head of state. He was the head Sir, of that. Sir Edward? Yeah, exactly. Sir Edward Winters. Okay. He had a party, Kabaka Yuka, he was the head of that party. And that's the person who's supposed to be the head of state. He's clearly a political person, he has political interests. And he's supposed to be in, in the head of state. So there is, the, you know, that was a recipe for disaster. Mm -hmm. You could have foreseen 1962 from 19, rather you could have foreseen 1966 from 1962. You could have seen that that was something that was going to happen. It was just a, you know, a, dyna a dynamite that was going to explode at some point. So uh, it is because we adopted the West Minister without taking into account our particular circumstances. The fact that our circumstances were different from the ones in the UK. Until 1966 happened because of that. Uh, attempt to adopt a model without considering our uniqueness. And then uh, that led to all the, to all the subsequent cases from 66 to 86. All that can be attributed to that mistake of 1962. Because, you know, we said in, you know, in 1966 when that happened, we said it's an opportunity for guerrilla war in 1966. Even though he was a student at the school, he went and talked to the Prime Minister of Korea at the time about the possibility of merging. The war, because it's so that uh, that animosity that had erupted between Buganda and the Prime Minister was, uh, you know, made, made became the fertile ground for for war. And so at that time, even though he was discouraged by the Prime Minister of Kode, uh, he kept it in his mind. And 14 and a half years later, he went to the bush and waged the war that, uh, you know, the bush war. So it was all traceable to the fact that in 1966. And we must erupted, which was which would have been for us in 1962. Because we had not we had adopted the model without considering the uniqueness of our circumstances. And so for me, if you're going to have a democracy that actually works, because you know, the fact of the matter is that democracy has not worked for us the last six years. And if we continue pretending about our circumstances, it's not going to work in the next six years. We're going to boldly face the fact that we are who we are, not we're not Americans, we're not Europeans. Yeah. Even the Europeans, by the way, when they were starting out, they started out with controversial arrangements. Only property people are allowed to vote. In America, women were not allowed to vote until 100 years ago. So they began with controversial systems, you know, until much later. Even by the time of independence, 1962, many black people were not allowed to vote until 1966. So you see that uh, they had to face their uniqueness. But we don't want to face our uniqueness. We don't want to face the realities of our country. We simply want to pretend. And that pretends will mean that we'll never have real democracy. What, what are the realities of that? Okay, exactly. That was from coming to. You see, recently, a gentleman who has been making a lot of news, he was, asked, he was on TV, one of the leading TV stations, Money and Grace or something. And he was asked about his current political situation. So he said that for me, uh, right now I'm a free man. He used the word free, a free, free, free man. He said I'm a free man. If Museveni calls me, Invites me, use the word invite. If he invites me, I'll go with him. If Bobby One invites me, I'll also go with him. Whoever invites me, that's the person that I'll go with. Okay? Mm. So he said he's a free man, and that's how we define freedom. And I think the reality of our country is that lots of people are free men in that, in that, in that definition. They're, they're very many people are free. They're non committal. No, 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 they're non committal. They're not tethered to any principles, they're not tethered to any values, any. They're not tethered to anything. They'll go with anything, or they will high speed that if there are very many people. For their support, they will give it to the person that comes with 
the most amount of money. Another thing that reality of our country from, 19, from the 60s, I mean 1967, after when they abrogated the constitution and abolished the monarchy, he tried to turn it into one party state. And all he had to do was offer some, you know, some, some, he made some offers to the people of the opposition, the DP party, which was the leading opposition party. He made them some offers. And after making those offers, uh, they crossed the floor. Almost all of them crossed the floor, but led by the leading opposition. That's what happened in 1967. The same thing happened in 2005. So he made offers to, uh, you know, to, the, to the MPs, and, and they changed the constitution, moved the term limit. The same thing happened in 2017. So you see, all throughout the history of Uganda, it has been like that. You can't find that in a de developed democracy. You can't find in a developed democracy all members of the opposition crossing the floor. That doesn't happen in a social democracy. Uh, you can't find people changing the constitution because they've been, made, they've been given some offers. That doesn't happen in a social democracy. So we've got to accept the fact that we're a country of free men. And the moment we don't accept that, and accept the fact that we, we don't have enough, whether moral fiber or intellectual fiber, whatever it is, but our people, our MPs are fully representative, perfect representative of our people, the people that voted them in, exactly like the MP themselves. They don't have enough moral fiber. They don't have enough intellectual fiber. And so they'll go with anything. That, I mean, if they're offered money, they will go with any position. As the gentleman that I talked about recently said on, on TV. So if you don't accept that, if you continue pretending, oh, we are, we are just people, we can make choices, all that nonsense. If you accept, if you continue, <laughs> I'm sorry. But, but I'm saying, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. If, if, if you continue pretending that we are serious people, that we are serious people, people are free, even, mm. that villager, if you continue pretending, we're never going to have progress. But let me first finish with one point. You find that in all the developed societies, all the developed democracies, they, 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 they've got two houses, two chambers. They've got the House of Lords and the House of Commons. In the US, you have the Senate and you have the House of Representatives. Even in India, in Ethiopia, they've got two chambers. And the upper chamber, like in the UK, they, they're not voted for through this direct democracy. They were voted for through some other procedures. In fact, up to 1999... Oh, they are UK, selected by the Queen. Yeah, some of them are selected by the Queen. Mm. In, in, in the UK, up to 1999, they, they were even... They would those positions. The person dies and this son takes over. Mm. That position also lost. So, uh, unless we accept the fact that this direct democracy is not going to work for us, and we need something like that, whereby we have another chamber, another parliament, which is selected totally differently. You know, either the association of professionals, each professional association can nominate somebody to be a member of that chamber. And you know, people who are really of high caliber, people who are able to think, who are able to make decisions without, you know, this, 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 this nonsense. Of, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and that. That Another nonsense. If we had a house like that, mm. and that house was supposed to, was supposed to, uh, was supposed to, for example, determine MPs' remuneration. They don't just determine their own remuneration, but they have to be approved by yeah. the upper house. Mm? All these major decisions, constitutional amendments, if the lower house accepts it, the upper house has to approve it. So if you have something like that... That's our magic bullet, huh? Eh? That would be something that would at least create some semblance of real democracy. In this oh, country. okay, okay. Uh, Dr. Na Nansos seems to disagree. Um, no, no, no. I, I listen to you. Thank you very much. The comments have um, raised a number of questions for me. Um, whenever I hear somebody saying, let's have an African type something, it always has a sense of inferiority. Let's not really have democracy, let's have the, our African thing. Let's our our thing. African thing. Mm -hmm. That to me suggests that if, if we are getting away from what the general principles that we all agreed on are, and we're having a watered-down version because we cannot or are unable to, 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 to meet um, the level of uh, required uh, in democracy. But so, is that uh, not being honest with us? Uh, it, it, you see, the thing is, when, when the uh, Asian Tigers decided that they would, they would concentrate on development as they conceived it, i.e., they would do democracy and free speech and all the other things that we consider important after they had developed. They did not say we are doing our own Asian tiger kind of democracy. They said, look here, we want to develop. Uh, as far as we are concerned, we are going to keep a hold on free speech 
and all the other freedoms that um, that um, associated with democracy until we reach that point where we have uh, developed and, and, and so on and so forth. So for me, uh, rather than saying let's have our own type of African democracy, because then who's going to define it for us? Mm -hmm. Who's going to define the African type of democracy? And when you talk about free men, I'm not sure which gentleman you're talking about, but uh, who was it? I, I don't watch the television. No, 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 no. Yeah. <laughs> now, this gentleman, the, the free man, um, unfortunately, uh, I, I have a little bit of history on him um, and, uh, and has made several claims of having worked with the late Paul Mwanga, which is not true at all. Um, he did drive, I think, his son, my brother, um, but he was not right. So he can be as free as he likes, but it, the, the, the likelihood is that if the other basis for him being a free man uh, or life, then that might also continue into our conversations. The other thing I don't want us to get mixed up is the commercialization of politics. Yeah. The commercialization of politics has come about because of the way in which we have begun to define, uh, sorry, uh, how we define what we do. Um, and so to say, oh, you know, when people are given a bit of money, they will move to this side and that side. Yes, you look at any political party. Sometimes before I worked, I think, I can't remember who, uh, which organization I worked with, but uh, I was working with different political parties about their ideals uh, and values and so on and so forth. And even the party which I thought I was wedded to, I was quite surprised. They, they didn't have anyone. <coughs> Uh, they, they, they had a singular formula and a, a singular interest. We must get rid of X. Mm. And I said, okay, okay, so we get rid of X, but what are your principles? What do you believe in? Um, if you go as far as, um, as um, uh, all over the country, and you ask people who belong to the old parties, mm. they can tell you, DP stood for this, UPC uh, stood for this, and so on and so forth. I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, uh, uh, yes, of course, the, there was a religious element and, and so on. Yeah. But the, 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 the fact is that somebody could tell you what they stood for. Today, I, I, I'm, 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 I'm hoping that by the time the elections come around next year, I would have decided on who to vote for. Because I don't see anybody standing for anything that I stand for. Mm. So, uh, hence, Mm. The dilemma and the commercialization of politics. Right. If you don't stand for anything, you will fall for anything. Yeah, right. Oh, um, yes. Yeah, just a moment. I, I want to bring in Michael Aboneka here. Yes, I am really burning. Mm. Please, yes. <laughs> jump in. You see, if you don't want the, the direction of the wind even, you've got to do something with the wind. Okay? Very philosophical. If you don't want the direction of the wind even, You've got to do something with the wind. Now, what we have here, we are chasing the wind bear instead of the wind. For six years, we are calling ourselves independent. But tomorrow, we are going to speak English. And now. And now we are speaking English, yes. It's an official language, yes. But, you know, th these are the discussions I have, you know, with kids playing pool. Like, so then what does independence mean for us? Article 4 of our constitution mandates government to translate the constitution into the indigenous languages. We have 76 indigenous la uh, languages or tribes in this country. For 24 years, that is almost half of, 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 the, of, of the years we've existed as an independent state of Uganda, we have not done that. I, and a certain magistrate, are actually going to court over that to say, government, you have a mandate to teach, to translate. Now, how are you going to say and stand tomorrow, ban billions of money, you know, we like events, then we say Uganda, you have women, you know? So, so, so we're going to have events, independence, yes, you are women, then they will leave everything that, but the point is, the Ugandans understand, the Ugandans understand what independence means. Teacher family did a street Check up, asking people, do you know your constitution? 
majority of people don't even know it. Others think it is black, yellow, and red. Others think it is owned by the Speaker of Parliament. So then what is it? And I am intrigued and, uh, by the discussion of, you know, of my, my colleague, uh, Mr. Katrina Masiko, uh, doctor. And, and for me, the point is this, that we, we, it is an excuse for us to say that you know, this thing doesn't work for us, let us formulate another one. But that one was already done. I'm going here, the African Charter on Democracy, Elections, and Good Governance. Uganda signed this charter on 12th December 2008. It's now 12 years, we haven't ratified it. Mr. But, Aboneka, okay. break yes. down for us how this differs from the universalist conception of exactly, democracy. Exactly. Mm -hmm. so, what are the key so the distinctions? Key, exactly. And are there no elections? Are there 20 year terms? I was trying to, was trying to office, actually expound mm -hmm. and say that the democracy that we thought we think that we want to bring, mm -hmm. our leaders went and sat and say that to heaven with this Western democracy. Let us come, come together and formulate a charter. This charter is here. African states, 34 of them, have already ratified it. Rwanda here has ratified it because state and they are reporting on it. This is the African democracy. So what more do we want? We have already a solution to the problem we are crying about, you know, the whites left us uh -huh. here. But you can do much better than them. D does it still include elections? Yes. Have to insist. Yes. Okay. Actually, chapter seven mm. of this chapter, which I've been fronting for ratification, mm. talks about elections. In this country, I want to ask you a question. What are the election standards of Uganda? Give me one book or give me any piece of information that has these are the election standards of the Republic of Uganda that everyone must adhere to. It is in the charter. Principles of, of, of you know, of, of uh, the power going to the people. Now, let me tell you this. If judicial power is derived from the people of Uganda, how come it is the president who appoints the judicial officers? Let me stop you at that point before you go into too much legalese. Uh, let me bring in your fellow advocate and lawyer, Mutesi. There seems to be several issues that are now beginning to coalesce and coagulate, mm -hmm. uh, monetization of politics, mm -hmm. and then the need to redefine our mm -hmm. conceptualization of democracy mm -hmm. and sort of domesticate it. I want you to talk on those two issues. You already told us that you agree with the need to domesticate democracy, but then add your voice as well to monetization and commercialization. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you, moderator, and thank you, my two brothers and mama, uh, Dr. Suzy. Um, let me start from, um, uh, you know, Dr. Suzy made some very intriguing comments. And uh, I loved it at the point when she brought in the three uh, major things that for her she looks out in democracy, access, inclusion, and participation. She seemed also to disagree with my earlier submission that it's a process, it's a journey. And she poses a question and says, until when? Mm. My answer is that even in the three most important aspects of democracy that Mama Dr. Susie looks for, uh, even the, 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 the first and oldest democracies that we pride in, like uh, the America and uh, uh, parts of Europe, is that they are also still fighting over the same. I, I, I made earlier statement saying that it is phased. The struggles are phased. When we were dealing with issues of liberation, the issues by then that took some of our current fathers in the nation to the bush were actually critical at that time. You also made a statement that you later shied away as a moderator and said DP was based on Catholicism and you withdraw it. True. It <laughs> was. A public rumor? It was. It's not a public rumor. Has it changed? Actually, the, 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 by then, at that time, in that context, it was a very crucial issue to answer. Mm. 
And that is why I want to bring this panel to, to, to a different level. That even now in Uganda, when we talk of human rights, when we speak of freedoms, when you look at what took some of our fathers in the nation to the bush, it was issues of freedoms and human rights and electoral issues dissatisfaction with the electoral processes. Mm. Today the tide has changed. Today society is, doing, is dealing with human rights but with minority groups. Just recently in Uganda we, we had a debate about the anti-homosexuality bill and all that. It caused a, a lot of debate. It ushered in a lot of interests and a lot of questions. Today when we, we, we hype the debate, you'll actually discover that the point of contention is not as it was in 2001. In 2001, actually, it was inclusion that Dr. Uh, Susie speaks about. It was about the freedom of multipartyism and political parties to actually go and align themselves onto their beliefs and values. And I like it actually when um, Nick, Nick Lisson brings in the issue of values and principles. Actually, that is it. When we come to that level and now start inquiring, what are our values? What are our principles? My, 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 my mama here, uh, Dr. Susie, um, she works with uh, uh, Julius Nyerere something. Leadership Center. A leadership center. I happened to spend three years in Tanzania as an intern under the Julius Mwalim Nyerere Foundation, headed by uh, Muzei Butiku. And what I found in Tanzania in those three years is that this particular nation, the fathers like Julius Nyerere, Kambarage Nyerere, they, 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 they focused this particular community, society, and the people onto certain principles that you cannot easily break in. And that is why even currently, Raisi uh, Magufuli, JPM, uh, um, you can see even the difference with how they've handled the pandemic. By denying its existence. After, oh, yes. And, and the truth yeah. is, the truth is that you go on social media, you will not find all this redundancy of, of Tanzanian people, youth, and all those people giving false news on social media. It is a contained society that discovered who they are. And I totally disagree with, again, Mama, Dr. Susie, who says when you try to simplify it and say, you see, we need an African belief-led kind of democracy, it is a sense of inferiority. Actually, it is a sense of superiority instead. It is a sense of superiority. Having pride in who we are. It is of late, I, I, I want to give the case of Karamoja. Karamoja, until recently, their voting partners were clan leader led. If you are to get a vote in Karamoja, you had to go to a clan leader, the heads of the corrals. Those are the people you had to convince. And the leaders had to come out and actually speak to their people and tell them, me as a clan leader, this is what I believe in and this is the person that will serve our interests as a clan. It was that community. Now, you ask how democratic is that because you're using the weighing scales of the Western democracy. No, but it is in, democracy, yes, it is, it is democracy in the sense of Karamoja society, in what they believe in, in what they value. The only thing that this democracy that we are clamoring about did was to actually dismantle the African setting. And that is why Mama, uh, Dr. Susie, says that actually it is a, a sense of superiority. Because to her, actually, when anything is African, it is inferior. No! No! 
it can never be inferior. It is actually a sense of superiority that after some time we can emerge out of what the construct, the blueprint has made us believe that now we can emerge and say we are a people and we have what shaped us. Look at the earlier years when we are bringing up these children. Are we nurturing these children actually according to the way of what the Western thinks? It is actually nurturing according to the way of African values and the principles. Now when the child is 18, that is when you want to introduce another concept in her life to tell her that actually the proper way of doing things is this way, which you've not nurtured her in. Second, another issue that I wanted to raise, you know, Muammar Gaddafi, the late, introduced what they called the third universal theory. The third universal theory highlighted something very important that up to today I believe in. He said representative democracy is actually not democracy. It is not democracy at all. I agree on that. So when we are uh, uh, speaking of, of the representation, the participation, truth is with the kind of democracy that we've borrowed from all over and using the blueprint that is not ours, we shall clamor and we shall struggle with it until cows come home. And because, be uh, uh, and we shall be milked and we dry. But surely, Mutesi, yes. what is the alternative? Dictatorship, the, like the alternative. No, 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 no. Mm. Actually, what seems to be dictatorship into the eyes of those who are who have adopted tenets of democracy, what seems a dictatorship? For, for example, I used the case of Karamoja. One would say that actually that is dictatorship of the highest degree. But yet to them, it is a democracy of the highest degree. Instance, when, we were dealing, um, when we were dealing with the, the, the insurgency in northern Uganda, a debate raged on. And there were voices that were saying, let us adopt African solutions to African problems. For you to end and answer the questions of the people in northern Uganda against the ALRA war insurgency is that we must merge up the Western kind of justice with the African best kind of justice. That is when you found the Bishop Odamas coming in and presiding over, bringing in the tenets of Matoput. When you go to, to Rwanda, when they were faced with the genocide, the biggest answer, the biggest percentage of justice actually came from the Gachacha. When you go to South Africa, a society emerging out of a side, actually Ubuntu worked for them. So how inferior is it? And how misled are we? How dictatorial are those systems? To me, I believe that we can get um, the good tenets of what the West presents into what Africa presents. It is undeniable. There are certain inhuman and, 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 and let me call it uncivilized tenets also in the African system. And degrading. Us. And degrading. But a merger shall not hurt us. First forward, Mr. Sirman, I want to we what have we done. I pride in the fact that we can fight and still remain together. I pride in the fact that even though our electoral processes end up with a lot of queries and believed and, uh, you know, um, irregularities and a lot of disparities. For example, the 2016 election. But my pride in Uganda and my hope is that we can still stay together. And we can still get together and say, let us go into another election. When we work on a few undoings as a society, and most importantly, highlighting the values and the principles that we stand for, when you look at our current uh, political parties, apart from the NRM, by the way, and not because that I'm here to speak for the NRM, but you can see President Museveni over the years, he has insisted on what he believes in. 
not what Uganda not what the party believes. Oh yes, what, what, what he believes in and therefore teaches the Ugandans what we should believe in. He, he, he highlights a lot of nationalism and gives a very broad lecture about it. So you can trust. No, 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 Michael, you shall have your moment. Okay. You shall have your moment. He also brings in the issue of Pan-Africanism, and you get to know this is the leader, and for him this is the vision, the prescription for what Uganda needs. Today, mm. let me sum it up. Today, somebody spoke of 19 seven crossings and that was Nick Lisson. Actually you can see that the very fever is still disturbing us even presently. Four months into a general election and there would be alternatives to what the NRM stands for are actually somewhere swinging on a swing. It is merry-go-round. It is merry-go-around. I'm either people power or I'm NUP, I'm this, I'm this. And then, and then afterwards, they get in there and they say, now me, I'll come as an individual. But those are the alternative voices. We have iPod that now brings sanity among these, that would actually prescribe to us principles and values like Michael raises and say, is there a template? Is there a template of what would be a, 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 a masterpiece of what our in elections and democracy would be. And we agree on that and say, whether I'm yellow, blue, green, or red, whatever I'm doing, the template is this one. Whether internally in a political party, in trouble, or as a country, this is it. And that is very critical. When we start thinking that way, then we are helping a people, we are helping a society to rediscover themselves and bring in ingredients that later will define us as a people. Thank you. Thank you, Mutesi. Very passionate delivery. Nicholson, you appear a little disconcerted by some things, or is it all of the things that Mutesi has said? Please respond. <laughs> So, so, you know, I, I can't believe when you told me that uh, somebody went to the bush to fight for human rights. Uh, and you know that that's the value that it still stands by. So there is no freedom of expression? No, no, no. I mean, you can't convince me that a mm. president is uh, you know, a champion of freedom. But, but that's a, a bad way. The, mm. the main point is, I agree with her, and I think it comes down to uh, the point that I raised earlier about the fact that uh, we're going to face the reality of, you know, of our people. The, the, the fact that uh, we are different and we've got to accept that. You know, when she talks about people jumping from party to party, today it's new, tomorrow it's DP. You know, when you think about it, it's all scheming. Mm. They're just scheming to go back to parliament. Yeah. All these people, it's just scheming to go back to parliament. There's nothing like being, having values or saying I'm in this party because of this party. It's just scheming to. But what's wrong with scheming? I mean, no. society is transactional. You just have to make sure that <laughs> as people who vote as leaders, yes. your interests are represented. So there is no problem with dealing oh, yeah. with a, oh, okay. but, but a good schema. In, in, mm. in, in, in a real democracy, mm. people would have real values. Okay? A party would have value that it stands by. Okay? I mean, if you go to America, for example, you find that everybody knows Republicans are pro-life. Democrats are pro-choice. Everybody knows that. As in, this is, everybody knows that this, this party stands for these values. But now, in, in our country, you can't identify any party that any political party stands for. You mean the ideology? Oh, you mean you ask them in one sentence, what is your ideology as a party? They don't have any. And uh, Dr. Monge said that in the 60s it was different. But it was not. It was not. Because in my area, for example, in Napoli, it was known. The, the, the only people that voted for UPC 
were Bible, you know, they are not like word Bible, but there were people called Bible. Peasants. Protestants. Who were the ones that voted for UPC. The Bible Catholics, they voted for DP. The Bahima voted for, whether by most of them actually Protestants, but they still voted for DP because of their. Because it was something different. So soon I find that it was just ethnicity and religion that defined which party you belong to. Nothing other than UPC might say, oh, it's not for this, this one goes, DP might say, but that's just on paper. In actual sense, in reality, people would vote according to religion and according to ethnicity. So yeah. what's the problem? Is the problem with the political parties having no ideologies? Or is it the society that is not mature enough ah. to adopt a value-based political yeah, system? Yeah, it is the society, yeah. the people, mm. the, the uniqueness of the Ghanaian people. Mm. Mm. Either because at that time, or even up to this time, we have never really had the right kind of education that has brought our mind to a point whereby we can be able to, to, to have a political value. But uh, Dr. Nansozi just pointed out how the enrollment and the literacy rates have risen astronomically uh, under the NRM. Excuse me, I will tell you. Even in fact, when uh, Mr. Bruneka mentioned that uh, the constitution be translated into local languages, mm. my question is: it, 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 it's right now in English. How many of the people that actually know English? I mean, we've got about 500,000 graduates in yeah. Uganda. Mm, yeah. How many of those have actually read the constitution? Or even seen it. Or even seen it. Or so so it. If, if, if the people who know English have not read the constitution in English, why do you assume that it is translated to local languages? People are going to read it to their local languages. Let me ask Dr. Nansozi to come in. Just hold that for now. Yeah. This, this is the simple work, actually. I think it's... Uh, <laughs> simple work, um, First of all, I thank my uh, co-panelists uh, for highlighting the gaps in my, in my, in my submission. Um, but uh, I, I'm not going to address that in full, except to say that I think you misunderstood when I talked about inferiority and, uh, and thinking that uh, African, um, Africanness is, is inferior. Yeah. Far from it. It is just that whenever we say we are going to do something in an African way, just as you say, this is African time, meaning it gives you it gives you a latitude to be three, four hours late, which is not only disrespectful to the person that you're meeting, but in terms of uh, being able to account for what you're doing. So it is not necessarily that it's inferior, but the way in which we ourselves um, uh, sometimes phrase it um, uh, and leave out certain things. I can foresee, for example, if we say that this is African way of democracy, which will leave me out as a woman, which will leave you out as a youth. For instance, the clan heads. Yeah, because, because you are not mm. in, in, in yeah. our African culture. And you've got to be men. Values. You don't have a voice. You mm. want to Keep quiet. Mm. We are the ones who know. Mm. Yes, don't, don't, don't talk. You know, excuse yourself. So uh, I, I, that's as far as I'll go with that. Now, the, the thing that, that, um, that, that I would like to talk about is my, my neighbor here. Uh, and, and part of it, I think, goes back to um, Ms. Mutesi talking about the benevolent dictatorship. Um, and that you, know, you can have a democracy where the, you have dictatorship, but it's benevolent. Um, I, I, I don't know. Um, and this is, uh, this, this is a question for, for, for all of us. Is, it, is democracy about benevolence from uh, an individual? Um, and, and that I will leave it right there mm. without necessarily answering it. But I, I think what you're describing, uh, by and large, is some form of benevolent dictatorship. Now, the other thing that I would like to, 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 to talk about and, and ask uh, from my neighbor here, if you're saying, you know, we don't, maybe we don't have values and so on, and uh, <coughs> education. The issue of education, I'm not talking about necessarily being able to read and write. Yeah. But being aware of what my rights are. If I don't know what my rights are, I can't hold you accountable. Yeah. If, if uh, all I'm told when the, the people come around to do civic education is, yeah, when you see that box, you mark X, that means that's the person you But if you don't tell me Where that the person I'm voting for should be able to do X, Y, Z for me on the day, after the day, and uh, within the year of being sent to Parliament. So I have a, I, I, I have a, a, a problem with that. Um, now, the other thing is about um, uh, whether or not, uh, you know, we have uh, something like, we've all agreed. Yes, in the 60s, maybe there was a leaning to Catholicism and Protestants and so on, but there was also a sense that one party did 
did have an idea of nationalism. And, and part of that is maybe what um, um, my co-panelist, uh, Ms. Musisi, was talking about. When you talk about the previous Kambarati, Nyerere Foundation, and, 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 and this center, and that actually was set up by the president. The leadership center was set up by the president, at my um, is, is that it's, it's a, an idea of nurturing leadership among young people that in, any, in some way nurtures the values that we value as, as Africans. But having said that, this does not take away from the three things that I talked about at the beginning. Access, inclusion, and participation. You cannot say that because um, somebody can, can think better for you or make a decision better for you, you should not have access or you should not be included or should not be uh, able to sit at the table and participate. I believe that it is not African or European to have access. We all have home households that we, we run. Yes. Yeah? Uh, if you decide that as the head of the household, you're going to make all the decisions, your children, your wife, your husband is not going to be included, you're going to have a serious problem. If they cannot in any way be included in terms of your thinking and in terms of their actions in what you do, then that is also a problem. Similarly with participation. Here we are talking about different places, you know, the, the Tanzanians, the, the Rwandese, the South Africans, and so on and so forth. Yes, and we know our history, and we know that we've had a turbulent past. And, and, and I agree with you, it is good that we have fought, we continue to fight, and yet we stay together. But the question for me, and, and, and something that has come up over the last several weeks, is maybe there's something that some of us lay people don't understand. What is it in politics that will have people going as far as wanting to kill each other? That would have, uh, you know, family literally tearing each other's eyes out? There has to be something beyond what we are here as panelists talking about. Our party ideology, uh, you know, a sense of uh, community, and so on and so forth. That maybe, if we understand that, we'll be able to address the issues as, uh, as panelists or as people who, who, who work with us. There, there is something that we, I, I, personally, I, I, I have agreed. And I've accepted that there's something that I, I'm missing because the level of ferociousness is not about wanting to serve my people and be accountable. It has to be something else. Maybe serving myself. I, I don't know. But I, I think that those are the questions that we need to ask ourselves rather than whether this is uh, African or European or whatever. All right. Thank you, uh, Dr. Nelson. Let me get back to Michael Aboneka. But before yes. I do that, I just want to make uh, some quick announcements. You are watching the fourth edition of the 256 Dialogues. And if you want to participate in this conversation as it is ongoing, please go to the comment section on our Facebook live feed on the African Studies Bookstore page and jot down your question, jot down your query, and I will be opening up a window for those uh, questions to be mooted to our distinguished panel. Our Twitter handle, um, or rather hashtag, is hash 256 dialogue. Hash 256 dialogue. So spread the word and keep the conversation going on our Twitter uh, handles for the African Studies Bookstore as well as the Friedrich Ebert Stifter. We look forward to hearing from you. So, Michael. Mr. Manzi, mm. I, I think I want to borrow the words of the president. I mean, <laughs> you see, shall we not sleep because we are afraid of dreaming? We will definitely have to sleep, and then along the way, we will, we will sort it out. Now, just to, 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 to respond to my colleague, uh, Mr. Trina Masuko, about the fact that people do not know the constitution doesn't take away the government's obligation to ensure that they teach the people the constitution, so that the people understand their rights. 
how come under Article 17 you're going to arrest someone for failing to pay taxes, but under Article 4 you don't want to teach them Article 17? It is an anomaly. So I think that we, we, we need as a country to be clear. The other point is about the Chief Charles de Gaulle said that politics is a matter too serious to be left to politicians alone. Now, I want to substantiate on the issue why I say representative democracy is a fallacy. When does the Speaker of Parliament ever represent the views of her people of Kamuli on the floor of Parliament? When does the Speaker of Parliament ever represent the voices and the views of the people from Kamuli in spite? I mean, when? When does the Deputy Speaker of Parliament ever represent the views his people on the floor of parliament. The rules don't allow them, but they are coming in saying we are representing people. But when they vote on an issue, they don't vote. Maybe it is implied. And you see, that's the, that's the point, that we are in these things, cosmetic things, and we think they are working for us. The other question I have asked and said, we shouldn't have ministers double as MPs. If you are, you are the lead of government business, you're the prime minister, at the same time you're an MP, and you're tabling government proposal to take over land of your people. So at what point are you going to come and say, now I am standing as the, the MP and saying now don't touch the land. Mm. So this whole confusion needs to be sorted out. Yeah. The other thing about this representative democracy being a fallacy is that there is no correlation between, you know, I have seven representatives, LC1, LC2, LC3, LC4, LC5, the, the district human MP, the direct MP, those are seven people. But what is the correlation of the seven people to the services? Because as a citizen, we give government two things. We give them power and we give them taxes. And what do we expect? We expect effective service delivery. In governance, in democracy, the definition of taxes changes. It's no longer non-quid pro quo. It is quid pro quo. I give something, I expect something in return. So that, that's so what democracy is built. That's on. what democracy is built on. That that's means the, the schemas that Nicholson was talking about so, are part and parcel. So, so I asked a question yesterday mm. that if we reduce the salaries of MPs to two million shillings, shall we have the same number of contestants standing? If we reduce the salary of MPs to two million shillings per month. Shall we have the same number of contestants that we are having today? But surely with the rate of youth unemployment, yes. two million shillings is a lot of money. Yeah, but you see that there are people who are mortgaging their houses. Mm. People are spending 200 million shillings in an election because they know they are going to return the money back. We cannot celebrate as a country and say we are independent. When our debt is close to 50, to, to, to 50 trillion, bigger than our budget. What is that? The money is that Okay, let us ask about the COVID funds. Where is the accountability? They are saying they don't have masks, they don't have test kits for the children to go to school. Where is the money? Who is following up on the money? Governance is not about, you know, maybe telling us, you know, we were there, we were there, now we are here. And the question I wanted to pose to her, so which phase are we? Because you say democracy is in phases. So what phase are we at and which one are we going to? The, the, the last issue is uh, on the issue of the political parties. I laugh at political parties. Can NRM survive beyond President Museveni? If President Museveni went to DP, will NRM as a party remain strong? Will NRM as a party remain strong? Let us build beyond individuals. And that's what democracy is about. And that's what institutions are about. That beyond individuals, we are able to give people our services. We are able to, you know, to respond to people. I've been telling people, ask your MP to account before they promise. Tell them for the five years you've been in parliament, what have you done? Apart from buying an ambulance, which you actually do not even transfer the logbook to your people. Once they lose an election, they repaint and take it you know, as their property. It's just sheer, you know, it's just for lack of a better word, they're just manipulating citizens, and this is actually high time for citizens actually to, to show their power. Because Article 1 says the power belongs to the people who shall exercise it in accordance with this constitution, they will determine how they should be governed. Now you should make sure that you give your vote to the person who deserves it. Then you can actually get the services you deserve. Yeah. yeah. Nicholson. Michael suggests the need to trim down the size of parliament and the need to realign some of these 
government portfolios and roles, what additional solutions, in a practical sense, you know, do you think need to be implemented to streamline this whole democratic and electoral quagmire that we happen to be uh, stuck in? Mm. Uh, so first of all, I definitely agree with him that uh, they need to create the service of uh, urban police. And I already talked about how that can be done. It's by having another chamber that uh, approves. Because at the moment, MPs determine their own nomination. So we need to have another chamber that uh, has to approve that nomination before it takes effect. And uh, that, that chamber it would have to be the members of that chamber would have to be selected in a different way, not through the direct marks. Because the truth of the matter, and for me, if I say only one thing in this dialogue, let's just be that we got to face the reality of who we are as Ugandans. How, how would they be no, selected? On the basis yeah, of ethnicity, yeah, exactly. by yeah, religious organizations? Mm -hmm. Because uh, the, the bottom line is, is this there are we are people who don't read. I mean, as a publisher, I know that. Mm -hmm. There are people who, out of 500,000 graduates, you'll find only 5,000 have ever read a book that was not part of their academic curriculum. But so, uh, if, 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 that is, if that is that is the kind of people that we are, and so we do take some of those parts. Then we have people who want to read. Don't talk about civic education. Like you're talking about, people need to be given civic education. I think it's uh, it's uh, actually uh, Dr. Yes. Mwangi was saying that yeah. the people need to be given civic education. How are we going to give people civic education if they don't want to read? You see, even if you put something there, that is, I mean, that means you're going to go through TV and radio, but you can't give enough civic education to that. No, but that, that, that is domesticating civic education to African circumstances, exactly what you're saying. You don't have to publish an encyclopedia. Because but you see, they ban, political, they, they ban political education, there's mm. no longer civics. Mm. Mary should tell us why we no longer have political education, civics taught in schools. Can I yes. say it? Uh, Listen, so finish I, I and then Mary will well, jump in. Uh, mm. So uh, w w the first thing that we must accept, we must stop pretending that we are it is a certain type of people. Mm -hmm. We just have to accept that we are people who don't read and, and try to find out what that implies about our about us. If we don't have enough curiosity to pick a book, what does that say about us? I mean, we only read a book if it's part of school, mm -hmm. but we don't have enough curiosity to go and pick a book that is not that is not enforced on us by school. So that, that tells about our our, our abilities as people. And but then to accept Nicholson, that, Nicholson, the most politically apathetic segment of our society are the elites. The ones who don't vote, yeah, the ones the elite, who refrain from because, participating because the in the political process. Because elites have realized, first of all, they are outnumbered. Mm. And so when you're outnumbered, you get to realize, if you're intelligent, you get to realize that it doesn't matter whether you vote or not, because you are totally outnumbered. So and that is people, exactly what will happen if more people read. No, for, mm. so, so you find that uh, you, you, you need to, first of all, accept that. When you accept the fact that uh, we have a problem, that problem, that as you said, we still have a problem. Other countries understood that when their democracies were just starting. That's why they limited voting to a few people. Only a few people were allowed to vote until the democracies had, the foundations had got laid. That's when everybody now was allowed to vote. So we have got to accept that that has also has to happen here. That's why I'm proposing that we must have a different chamber where people are voted for, not through direct democracy. You know, you have like associations of professionals selecting people. Somebody has got to be selected. And for somebody to compete in that, for somebody to participate as a, as, as, as a candidate for that position, you know, to be a member of that upper house, he has got to demonstrate certain qualities. He has got to, to, to either pass a test or whatever, to demonstrate that he actually understand things. <laughs> so that you have high quality people in the upper chamber. And these are people who are supposed to now regulate, uh, uh, you know, control. Intellectuals of some sort. Yeah, intellectuals. They, they control the lower chamber so that they determine what prices can be you so know what you're creating classes with people now no not, not you're creating classes uh, because you see that, uh, for me what I want to disagree with eh? mm. she said I'm proposing benefit citizenship it's not true because it is still democracy in the sense that the people are I make mean, decisions are being made by voting whatever but the question is who votes 
The question is what? And, and in all democracies world over, that has always been, it has not always been constant, but it has been versus adult suffrage. It is, so my, my point is not that I, people shouldn't vote, but the question is who does the voting? Okay. And then who qualifies to be voting for? Yeah. You see? But Otherwise, it is still democracy. Mm -hmm. But to accept that, the, people, the way we are as a country, not everybody should be allowed to vote. vote, and not everybody should be allowed to contest for certain positions. And then after we agree on that, we can have a different chamber, which at least exerts some control on the other chamber where, where people are not voted for the old way. Because you see, in 1969, mm. Dr. Body came up with a very good idea, although it didn't get implemented in 1971 because it had been removed it. But he had come up with an idea of three plus one system. In the three plus one system, every person was supposed to compete in four constituencies from the four different regions. You know, you have, you have like, you, ra you run as a, a member of parliament in Mokono municipality, but you also run in Mbara municipality, you know, different, different regions, in the central, in western, in north, and eastern. So you, you, to be a member of parliament, you had to win in all the four constituencies. Then that's when you would be. That's when you would go to parliament. So in order to win the four constituencies, you have to first of all be somebody that, you know, that that, that say things that are all the people in the country can connect with. You would not just be a provincial politician just trying to appease your constituents. You you'd have to be able to speak this kind of language that everybody can understand. So if we had something like that, if we revived that idea, and we selected people participants, and those people became part of. It would still be democracy, it would still be, but now it would be a different kind of democracy. system. So that those people at least would be of higher caliber and they'd be able to get some control on the lower chamber of the house. So that you have control, you know, checks on the other people, so that uh, we have more meaningful democracy. Okay. That is what I would think. Yes, I have a just counter proposal in 30 seconds. Mm. This is what I suggest. That the they, being they, they, are, they actually are building a new one. I think they have, back, they have bastardized us as Uganda. You know, and demonized us to, to things like, you know, I give you a t shirt and you give me five years salary. So, but the, the point is, let's get back to our four cent sticks. And that is option two is can we have is about appropriation, is about oversight, is about legislation. Now, if you can't even speak English, or you can't even, you don't even know how to legislate, what are you doing there? So let us have the Kenyan way, like the judiciary. You put your papers, the public vets you, and then there you go. Perhaps we shall achieve after what we want to do. You are busy uh, in the, so I, I would love to see one day that parliament have back to Asia, and it is possible. And we have tabled all these proposals. And we hope that Mary, in, in their glory, will accept this proposal. <laughs> <laughs> Before I bring in Mary, I just mm. want to congratulate you on contradicting yourself. Earlier, you said you are putting English for the problem. Yeah. Now you're putting it up as one of the key standards. Let me bring in Mary. Because, because unfortunately, you don't have unfortunately mm. we have 76 tribes. Mm. And the constitution says that the official language shall be English. Mm. And the other language shall be Swahili which none of us here can speak for one minute. So speak for yourself, please. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, yeah. so we have so Mary that's, that's and uh, Dr. Nancy. We need to, mm. to sort out. Because okay. which language are we going to teach? And which one are we going to give out? So we need to balance it. Yeah. Okay. Miss Mutesi. Thank you. Um, I, I, my earlier perception of this um, engagement was that uh, it was uh, a leap higher from the usual uh, radio vimezas and media uh, operations. And uh, I, I want to stay at that, that um, uh, dynamism is required here. Um, my coming here was not uh, to present a certain view or defense, but was to share with uh, the broader uh, thinkers and people who are thinking ahead of, of the usual trivialities of this one belongs to here, I've been with her in this place, so I don't want to be dragged to that level. So, 
This is, um, uh, to me, what I think. I mean, they are, I, I, uh, uh, Fra and Nick Lisson and um, Dr. Susie and uh, also Michael, they, they bring in very interesting um, arguments on the table. But um, there is, uh, what we need to do, we need a total deconstruct. If you want to find where the problem is, we need a total discontrast of what we've made ourselves become. People, uh, just last night, I drew a table and uh, I was thinking, what is the motive of a member of parliament looking at what is happening? And I was looking at what transpired in our NRM primaries and the kind of, of, of response that some of our people actually uh, uh, showcased with a lot of violence, a lot of bare knuckle fighting. And the question kept on ringing in my head as I was working in my garden somewhere. I was asking myself, what is the motive of this member of parliament? What is the interest? And then I, I drew a table and I said, is it a struggle for power or is it a control of resources? Because when actually when you zoom, Dr. Susan, when you zoom into the August house, you discover that actually there are no resources that this MOP from Kamera Maido is controlling. The struggles that I referred to at, uh, at the beginning in my opening remarks, you discover that there is a baseline of African struggles, that the struggle was about resources that are not working for the indigenous people, but are being, uh, you know, uh, swindled into a different setting. And I think that formed the basis of the earlier ideologies. That formed the basis of the Julius Kambaraga Nyereres. That formed the basis of ideologies of the Mandelas, the Kwame Nkrumahs, and their sons thereafter that got a, a, a chance to be mentored into that. And when you look at President Museven, I don't bring in this for purposes of a defense of the system or NRM, but I'm using it as a live example. You can of Mwali Munyerere at certain instances actually coming little speech, little has he spoken and you don't hear him referring to his father. You can see his connection even earlier and uh, that is also when we make a mistake when we are diagonizing the current happenings in the country is that we view Museven from the 1986 the struggle. But we don't see this leader currently in Uganda from the background of his interactions with Mozambique, with, the, uh, with Nelson Mandela, with the Gaddafis. And when you mention the Patrice Lumumbas, when you mention those names, it takes you to somewhere. And it will be a surprise actually that uh, today if he was fronting an idea of his fathers. But there are four. Mutesi, if I could just yes. interject yes. briefly. Mm -hmm. The crop of leaders mm -hmm. that were hosted by Museveni mm -hmm. and his generation mm -hmm. were also heirs to that same history of leadership. Mm -hmm. Dr. Obote, for instance, was a very close friend yes. to Mali Munyerere. Yes. So what comparative advantage does this give General Museveni? And, and, and also, um, that's where I want to bring you first forward, that for an answer to the current queries that Uganda have, there has to be somebody who has been fathered into this very system and therefore sensed the rip holes of what is lacking. So that is the diversion between the other uh, the, the leaders that um, President Museven uh, took over from to him. And therefore, uh, the, 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 the current Uganda, for someone to be able to take over 
from the current leadership. He has also to zoom into the kind of leadership, discover where the disconnecting dots that I can fix. But actually, that is the question now. We, we all view it in my kind of lenses is that the disconnect is that someone somewhere who is offering alternative leadership is not telling us the disconnecting dots and therefore is not telling us the connecting dots that he wants to bring on board. And what happens in an election is that when we see, learn, understand and hear these people speaking and bringing their kind of menu on the table, we make judgment and we say, therefore, better the other person. Because these are new. The other thing, the point that I was making, when you look at, at the, the, the stratification of our society, is that the elites are believing into something. And that is why I speak of a total disconstruction of the mind. Materialism has swallowed us. Whether is a private legal practitioner or a private medical practitioner, the one point and, 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 and motive is a margin of wealth. Because that is how we've ourselves to be. Make a differentiation and a comparative, a comparative analysis with the first cadres like Musayi Kirunda Chive Jinja. <laughs> He's a person, I'm his grandchild. And we are from the same family. But when I finish university, my earlier thinking is what is popular in Uganda, that I'll go to my grandfather and I'll speak to him and I'll get positioned somewhere. He sat me for three hours, lectured me and told me how I should go and look for my own ways. That is not how life is made. Up to today, you don't run to this old man. No way. He will lecture you and he will tell you how they started the struggle and how they've now ushered this current Uganda that we see. The construct now that we have is a construct of materialism, selfishness, the kind of pressure, uh, uh, and Mama, Dr. Susie, the kind of pressure that some of us have, even at our workplaces, even after someone watching this kind of dialogue, the pressure that you have, that people create in you, that you're, 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 you're a parliamentary material, why don't you go? And the, uh, why don't you go? And there is this constant pressure. So we have a problem that right now, as a child goes to school, the only bar, and I repeat this, the epitome, of an ordinary elite articulate intellectual is that I'll go finish my degree and after finishing my degree I can do a master's. After that master's even others go for PhD. I'll never forget one of my colleagues we were in a church setting and the, the, he came and gave testimony that you see um, I'm going to defend my, my PhD thesis and I'm one of the best and I've done a, a PhD in taxation something something and then he said therefore when you see me becoming an MP please don't be surprised I said hey <laughs> wait a minute you mean all this struggle and all this effort to get a PhD and only to end up as an MP. It is to end up as an MP. So that is how low we've sunk as a nation that the greatest individual and the most respectable and the most honorable person we have in our community is a member of parliament. Well, once, uh, listen to this. Once we overhype 
Once we overhype their importance, once we overhype their profiling, and we don't look at other abilities of the professors, eminent women and men, like Dr. Susie, and now the doctorate gives way to an honorable title, then we are actually mingling ourselves into mud. That there are four other sections of society, other ways and approaches and routes and platforms of contribution are going to be rendered irrelevant, nothing, the technical wing has been rendered nothing and useless. Nobody speaks of you and say, I think you have very good policy approaches and proposals. I think we can now guide you into the technical field such that you're the people now to cook this into the, ba the background to be discussed by those people. Because the electorate, the election process, is actually not producing the cream de la cream, is not producing the, the intellectuals, is producing the, cal the caliber of people who can excite a voter to the vote. I can just be uh, a good comic, you know, expert, and I end up in parliament no matter what I'm going to do. Therefore, we are lacking that. If we are looking for a solution of how we can salvage the situation and assist Uganda, we must get to that point. Leave alone this Wolokoso that we do. We do. No, 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 no. There must be platforms like these that have been enabled by Frederick Hebert Foundation, that have been enabled by people who are zooming their senses into what Uganda is and what Uganda should be tomorrow, and therefore bring genuine reflections and discussions on the table. And if we can graduate, from the usual debate of so and so versus so and so, the trivialities, then we are getting there. Thank but you, thank you, Mary. Thank I'm you. Going to ask that you hold it there for a bit. And uh, in our defense, this is certainly not a chimeza. <laughs> uh, I'm sure that your co panelists have only been trying to call out the responsibility uh, that the incumbent leadership has rather than uh, hitting below the belt. Taken. Yeah. So um, I would like to remind our viewership that you can still send in your questions. And as we approach the end of our conversation, before we go back uh, to our panel and ask them to give us uh, what would be uh, their recapitulation and take home from this conversation, I'm going to just quickly uh, direct a few questions to them from our audience. This is a question from Phil Wilmot. And he asks, is electoral democracy a role uh, merely to be played by a majority? For example, if it is the case in Uganda, why do we not lower the voting age to accommodate the majority of Ugandans? He doesn't mention a number, but he says Uganda is not that is ruled by all the people and by they that cannot be changed uh, without a revolution. So he's calling for young people to reflect their numbers in the political power that they have. Dr. Nansozi, uh, would you kindly take this on first? Um, okay, I was preparing for closing remarks, but... Uh, okay. <laughs> I, I don't think that we should think of um, democracy or electoral democracy as a number thing. Uh, that it's uh, old versus young or young versus old. Um, about three years ago, we, I, we had a, an interesting um, uh, uh, we had an, I, I had an interesting uh, dialogue at, at, at Nakere. Um, and I, I remember one one phase. Uh, of course, there was uh, there was uh, Honourable Chavulani was there, and so was the president at the same time. It was uh, to honour Nelson Mandela, and I remember this very same comment, dressed in a different way, being made by uh, Honourable Chavulani. 
that it's time for people to move on and young people to move in. And I also remember the response once the, um, uh, the president came onto the podium and, and, and said that it's fine, but, but it has to be measured. You cannot just say sweep out the old people and let the young people come in. Because much as the demographics tell us that they are, you know, on the increase and they're the majority of the population, um, we need to, to foster or to have fostered some of the things that uh, uh, my, my co-panelists have been talking about, some of those principles and ideals and values in order to be able to, to, to properly be prepared for, 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 um, for ruling. So I know that the question the person is posing is not about ruling, but it's being able to elect um, and, um, and being able to vote. Uh, and I'm, I'm assuming that if you want to lower it below 18, you're talking at around 15 years old. I, I would like to talk to my 15-year-old self. <laughs> and, 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 and wonder whether my 15-year-old self would be able to make the kind of judgment uh, in terms of what is in my interest. Because at that age, my interests change almost on a weekly basis. Today it was this, next week it was something else, and so on and so forth. So without necessarily getting away from the question, I don't think the issue is about numbers. And it's not about lowering the age. Um, it is about allowing those who can vote from the age of 18 and allowing those who are already voting, who are older, to be able to actually make the, the desired choices for you and, and for, the, for the rest of us. Um, because if you say, no, 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 let's let only 15 year olds from 15 because they're the majority, it is, it's, it's almost assuming that, that uh, the rest of us are unable to, um, unable to make those decisions. Um, so the person who, present, who asked this question, I, I think it's not a numbers game. And yes, your time will come if you're already 15 or maybe a little bit older, but I think that we need to take this as a serious issue, as a, as a, as a matter of national interest. It's not just individual interest. I try to relate is that when we got independence, did we allow ourselves time to work on a system that will work for us? Or it was just a matter of all lowering down the union jack <laughs> and pulling up our flag, which we shall be doing tomorrow. Which shall be doing tomorrow. Yes. And people will eat pilau and go home. Was it was it just about that or it was about the system? Look at the judiciary, look at the wigs we wear, look at, you know, all this system we have. You know, of course, the economists, uh, the economists say we are still learning new colonialism. These guys have never left. They left the system. Look at the archaic laws. 1932, you know, law that, we are, that, that was used by the colonialists is what we are still having. I think I agree to a large extent that since we moved on, we need also to continue to move on with the systems and to ensure that power does not only lie at the top, at the monarch, passing as a president. So, so we need to ensure that... I thought that was a slip of time. Uh, no, it, it's, it's deliberate because you look at the system. You can't appoint all 200 commissioners. You can't appoint all these ministers. You, you get tired. I was actually telling someone yesterday that I picked my president. He needs to rest. Everyone is going to him. So he needs to rest and, and you know, think about strategic things. But the voters want to see him. The one who wants to open the wants to see him. Uh -huh. No. I agree on that. Okay, yeah. Uh,
kind of federal arrangement, something that is uh, default. Yes, and I think this is why I don't know. Maybe Dr. Suzu will tell us uh, how how the national dialogue. You know, we've been talking about the national dialogue as a country. Um, can we reach a point where we dialogue and say, guys, this is where we need to go? The problem has been that they, they are, we, should, we assume there are only various types of people who should be in the front seat to drive. But they forget there are people in the, in the back seat as well. Mm. They are equally important. So we need to get to a, a level where a country we say, you know, guys, let us sort our country. Because there is only one Uganda and we shall all be here. And I keep telling people, don't run away. Come back. We sort our Uganda together. All right. Yeah. Okay, so Maybe I can I just answer mm. very quickly that the, the issue of a national dialogue, I think that what has a, 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 we have disagreed uh, to a certain extent in, uh, in our presentation, but one thing that seems to be clear from all of us and what we seem to agree is that something needs to be fixed, that there's a, a disconnect and that disconnect needs to be fixed. And I think we can't talk about fixing the political disconnects that actually exist without necessarily having a national dialogue. Um, I don't think the national dialogue only belongs to certain classes of people. I think that, that that would be wrong. But I think that we need to ask some of the harder questions of where are we right now and where do we need to be? Uh, not only in terms of our, 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 polit our political journey, but in terms of the manner in which we contest um, recent recent uh, calamity of COVID has taught us yeah. something that we need to take uh, a step back and decide on what needs to be done. The minute we were, we, we were uh, confronted by the pandemic, it's interesting that all of us, suddenly it was as if we were singing from the same hymn sheet, where the mask sanitized, have your temperature taken. Now, it, it, it was not that we were, you know, uh, whether you go as far away from Kampala as, I don't know, um, um, I don't want to say which, which place, but anyway, far away from Kampala, you find that most people uh, have actually taken it to heart that you have to wear a mask, that you have to sanitize, and in some places you have to have your temperature taken. Why can't we do that about our politics? Oh. Why can't we take the temperature of where we are in terms of our politics? Why can't we put the mask in terms of sometimes we don't all have to be speaking at the same time and we don't necessarily all have to you know, have the last word? And finally, if, if we've taken the temperature, if we've worn the mask, maybe sometimes we need to sanitize the way in which we talk to one another oh. uh, so that it, that ultimately, rather than reviling and abusing one another, we actually take time to listen to one another and, and, and be able to, to do the necessary, and which is to have a national government. All right. Uh, All right. I hope those will serve for you. <laughs> yeah. I realize that we are out of time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, to add something to that. My question for you as you uh, do that mm -hmm. would be this pandemic and our government's response to it has shown that if our leadership is serious about something, they can actually do it. Yes. You know, so they have the capacity to perform when they mean to. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that the dysfunction is deliberate, perhaps, intentional? Close, wow. please. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's a oh, trick question. Oh, yeah. um, I, I think the response to the COVID is, is amazing. Um, uh, uh, my daughter came back from TZ yesterday and she told me that they don't have the shields, they don't have the masks, and in fact she went with hers, it was confiscated at the airport, and she was told not to, to, to wear those things because, you know, she was al making people alarmed. Now, I think that you, we will all agree, and, and other people outside of Uganda have agreed, that the approach to the pandemic was actually very smart and very timely and on point. Um, now, if you juxtapose that approach and the response to the other things that are not working within our politics and our electoral system, I don't know that the question I'd ask is whether it's deliberate. I think we haven't taken as much time to think about it 
and maybe it is not as frightening as looking death in the face. Uh, and maybe because of the way the pandemic was presented, the idea was that, you know, if you don't do this, this is the immediate uh, uh, you know, uh, catastrophe that's going to happen. And, and maybe that's why the leaders have not done what they need to do in order to fix a system, a political system, that is actually tithering and likely broken. In terms of my own personal remarks, is that the idea was to look at the future of electoral democracy in Uganda. I think that, yes, we're not yet there. Yes, we need to deal with what we can and what we need to do right now. That elections in and of themselves are not a panacea. Just going to the polls and uh, putting your ballot box uh, in a ballot box, your vote is not a panacea. It's not going to solve it. And that despite everything or uh, anything, the institutions that have been created should actually be allowed to breathe, to work, in order to be able to say to that, that democracy. Access, inclusion, participation, for me, remain fundamental, practical measures of whether or not we are on the right Thank you very much, Susie. Nick Dixon, uh, very briefly, please, close. Uh, thank you. Uh, you know, from my education background, eh, I did a lot of curves. You know, in engineering and you know, in math and all that, we did a lot of curves. Eh? And uh, one thing that uh, you will know when you do a lot of curves is that uh, a curve, the direction in which the curve is going, tells you about where it's likely to end. And that, that's why when you talk about the future of electoral democracy in Uganda, I want to look at also the past and the present. Because the past and the present give us the curve from which you can extrapolate to get the possible, uh, the possible destination you know, the possible future. And uh, looking at the past, the present of democracy in Uganda, I'll tell you that uh, it has been a total disaster. It has not worked. Instead of being a tool or something that is used to achieve service delivery, because that's supposed to be the end. The end is supposed to be service delivery. But instead of being uh, something that is used to achieve service delivery, it has simply been manipulated to serve the interests of politicians, the selfish goals of politicians since independence. From 1962, when Obori and, uh, and uh, Kabaka sat down to come up with a system that would get them into power without really thinking about the country. From that time up to the present, politics, democracy has just been used as a tool to, has just been manipulated to achieve the interests of politicians. And so if you're going to have politics that actually achieve the goal of service delivery, then we've got to have radical decisions, to go to radically face the fact of who we are, First, the fact that as a country, you know, everybody in this country has enough knowledge, enough information to make a decision. Because you cannot, if you make a decision, a decision is only as good as the information on which it's founded. And in our country, not enough people have enough information to make correct decisions. So we've got to face that fact and limit the voting to only the people who have adequate knowledge to make decisions. Otherwise, we're just going to keep pretending and we shall keep in this curve that is actually going down and pretend that actually they are going up and actually every, all the evidence is that are actually going, going down instead of upwards. All right, thank you, Nick. Cool. I hope shall heed the advice, Mr. Boneka. Yes, thank you to all and all the panelists. I, I like this, the energy and how we're closing. That's no one of us is running out of the banner. We're going to fix this with them together. And um, I've been telling my colleagues in the diaspora that it's not enough just in remittances. Battle says that the worst literate is the political literate. They know that they don't want to hear politics, neither they want, do they want to participate, yet they don't know that the price of beans, the price of bread, the price of shoes is determined by politics. So we need to engage and participate in politics. Number two, let us allow the right to dissent. You can disagree within your party, you can disagree in your home, but respectfully. Three, let us allow room for leadership, for mentorship. I want to say a political party that, that does mentorship. Frederick Ebert Stifton mentored me in the leadership program for a, a full six months. Probably, that's why probably I, I, I try to do something. So mentorship, political parties, where is the mentorship for young leaders? Last is, so for me, is the, let us have respect for each other. 
let us have let us be tolerant for me to ask questions about your political principle or your president or asking for credentials i am entitled don't you know, attack me on, on facebook don't attack me because I ask questions about you know your, your candidate let us be tolerant and let us you know at the end of the day these guys go to parliament they go to state house and we still remain neighbors and we ask so to me so we need to ensure that we are harmonious in this country elections should never separate us okay. yeah. thank you for that uh, harmonious and very cordial <coughs> conclusion yeah. miss Thank you so much, and I appreciate uh, my fellow panelists from Mama, uh, Dr. Susie, Nick Lishon, and uh, my brother, Michael. Three things. One, um, it is a recommendation from the depths of my spirit, is that we should do, adopt a more proactive orientation as Ugandans. Uh, into something that can secure us as a country. Number two, it is my belief that we should do, approach the demographic equation with a lot of consciousness. We should be conscious about it. And uh, uh, actually, it is caution. We should be very cautious about it. Uh, because I usually tell people an 18 year old of today will be the old man some years to come. It is a transition. I would love to join my brother Michael in saying that uh, we could only coexist and uh, tolerate one another because we are a people and we are staying together. So it is not about the demographics of these are youth and their numbers according to the first question that our uh, follower actually asked. Then lastly, we should endeavor to insulate ourselves against gambles. What I've discovered that in Uganda, we want to gamble every concept, every theory that comes on board when we see defiance has worked somewhere, we say, let us try it out. When we see the Red Beret movement has worked somewhere, we say, let's go in for it. When we see Arab uh, Spring and uprising, and we say, let's go in. So we make ourselves a gamble, an experimental lab, I would do, propose that let us adopt a perfect intent in whatever we do. Let us perfect what we have and every day let us re reflect back to the preamble of the constitution of Uganda. It informs us where we are coming from and what we wish to become and let us stay to that. Thank you very much, Mutesi Mary, speaking like a true stateswoman. Mm -hmm. I would like to thank our audience that has stayed with us to the end of this fourth edition of the 256 Dialogues. It's been a great honor on my part to host and Under the banner of the 256 Dialogues, wish you a happy 58th Independence Day, Uganda, and we hope that the future can only be better. Thank you, and goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank Great. you, thank you. Where is the handshake? <laughs>